Good morning. We're all very welcome. Anybody who's visiting us this day, we bid you a special welcome. And again, we're delighted to have people listening by means of CD and internet. And also our YouTube channel. So, Joe, you could be a YouTube sensation by the end of this evening. You know, so maybe that's something you never, ever heard before, Joe fell on YouTube. But anyway, it's going to happen today. Flowers today have been put on by David and Heather Glenn. And our church monthly lunch is on Tuesday, the 28th, this Tuesday coming at 12.30pm. We have a committee meeting organised for Tuesday the 11th at 7.30pm up in the Upper Hall. And we have the plugged in service is on Sunday the 9th of February at 6pm. So everybody will be very welcome to that. This is the last Sunday for the one pound jar donations for January. So if you haven't got the pound out of your pocket yet, there's a chance to do it on the way out. And then we'll get it counted and let you know what the total is next week. There's one other announcement I'd like to make, and it's just in regards to uh, a brainstorming exercise that we had with regards to our, our fundraising at the end of last year. And the pound jar was one of the things that we come up with as a, as a venture that we could, we could run with. And another one we come up with was what we call a birthday sacrifice. The one thing that we're all assured of between now and the end of next January is that every one of us will have a birthday. And you may have seen in the announcement sheet last week that there is uh, there was a wee announcement, what do you buy the person that's got everything? And to be quite honest, there's not very much at our time of life that we need and really need. So the church is in need of money. So we decided that we give people the opportunity to instead of getting their family and their friends to give them birthday presents this year, if they could give them a subscription towards the building fund, the person who's the birthday collects it and brings it then in an envelope and gives it either to my mother or myself or, or anybody for that matter, with just birthday sacrifice and your name on it and your address, and then we'll put that into the building fund. And we felt that that would be a way that instead of getting the same people to come to every event that we organise in the church, we could spread the net a wee bit wider and get people who maybe don't normally contribute to, to our, our building fund or certainly maybe don't come to events that we would run and we would be able to maybe get a wee bit of extra revenue that way. So if you would like to do that, there's an opportunity to do it between now and the end of next January. So we have a full year to do it. So when your birthday comes round, you can think about that for us if you would, please. I'm delighted to welcome the Reverend Joe, Dr. Joe Fell to our, our pulpit today. Pulpit, as well, we're lectern more than the pulpit, but... Um, we're delighted to have him. He was with us while we were vacant and did excellent work with us on our, our midweek services and visiting our housebound. And we're delighted to have him back again. He's no stranger to most of us. That's all the announcements. Just let us pray. Our Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to come into your house and worship you. We know this is a privilege which we don't take lightly and we, it's something that we as a, as a congregation come together and offer prayer and praise to you, the God Almighty. We thank you again for all the ministry that happens around this area. And we think especially today of First Derry Presbyterian Church, who, who Reverend Latimer is having his last service there today and moving on to pastures new in retirement. And they will be vacant now. Again, through that vacancy, Lord, be with them as a congregation and so they can get leave to call at a fairly early stage and be able to get some stability back again within that congregation at First Derry. Lord, we thank all of the people within our congregation who are struggling in any way at this time. Be with them and know that your grace is with them at all, all of these very special times for them. And Lord, you're the person who knows who is in that person in need. For we ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, George, for your kind welcome. Glad to see you all this morning. And we're here to worship God together. And I thought that I would read to you some verses from Isaiah chapter 6 as we begin our service. Um, we live in times of great change. We're leaving the European Union, as you know, and there's been changes here in Northern Ireland. And all the time when there are changes, there's great uncertainty. And the prophet Isaiah <clears throat> records about the death of a king and when a monarch dies there's always a time of what's going to be the future questions are being asked 
And Isaiah, whenever he, he knows the king has died, he goes into the temple and he sees the Lord on his throne. <clears throat> A lot of changes have taken place within Northern Ireland. We are rightfully concerned about some of them, but we shouldn't be concerned to the point of despair because God is still on his throne. <clears throat> And then, as you know, he's stunned by the holiness of God, and then he responds to the call of God. So this is what Isaiah 6 says to us. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. With it he touched my lips and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away. And your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And God calls us all. And today, when he calls, we need to say, Here am I. Send me. Let's stand and sing the praise of God now as we join them in singing, Jesus is King, and I will extol him. <clears throat>
And as we have been singing praise to God, now let us bow together as we seek him in our prayer. Let's all pray. Great and wonderful triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we have come to worship you and we bow before your majestic throne. By word and praise, we have heard of your exceeding greatness, power, love and grace. By your word, you created everything that exists. Universes yet unknown are known to you. We marvel at the range of the creatures you have made, some massive and many minute. We are amazed at the wonder of all that you have done. And you have made yourself known to us as a God of order, immense power and wisdom. And so the psalmist can say, the heavens declare the glory of God. How majestic is your name in all the earth. And we worship before you this morning. As we wait before you, Lord, may we renew our strength. It's not easy living for your glory in these difficult days. Give us grace to live as we ought. Provide words for us to speak as Jesus promised when we are speaking for him. And may your glory in the whole earth be our supreme concern. Teach us more about Jesus this morning as we consider him in his role at creation, in his compassion, and in his cross. Lord, we realize that we are being read every day like books when people listen to us and watch us observe our actions and reactions, they read us, may they find and read about Jesus in us. As we worship in Dermot this morning, we remember the persecuted church in countries like Nigeria, North Korea, China, and Iraq, and the Cameroons. Bless the leadership of your people in those countries where persecution is near, and watch over and provide for the needs of the present-day martyrs, of which there are very many. Bless their families at this time, we pray. Forgive all our sin, forgive our greed and our pride, forgive our hurting words, forgive our thanklessness, forgive our silence in the face of injustice, We come as sinners to the holy God in prayer, asking for forgiveness, and we rejoice that Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. We glory in his cross, and we rejoice that he's alive forevermore. Fill us now, Lord, with the Holy Spirit, we pray. Deliver us from grieving the Spirit or quenching the Spirit, But let us live and walk in step with the Spirit every day and bless the work in Glendermot now as we worship together and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to read together from the book of Psalms. It's always good to read a psalm. And uh, Psalm number 121, which we probably know by heart. And the psalmist begins by uh, lifting up his eyes to the hills. And you may wonder why he asked the question, where does my help come from? Well, when he looked out on the hills in his day, the hills were used by the worshippers of false gods called the Baals to put their little monuments to their gods all around. Every hill that you saw had a little building on it, and it was to the false gods. And there are many gods today. 
many false gods. And all of us sometimes worship those gods. Ambition and sport and food and the things that you and I can worship, easily worship them. So the psalmist says, when I look up, he says, where does my help come from? Well, my help comes from the Lord. So let's read it together. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel, that's the church, will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen. And God, we know, will bless his word to us. Would the boys and girls like to come forward for a few moments? I'll make my way down. So when I disappear, don't worry, I'm coming back. All right, Mark. This is like an obstacle course, isn't it? Nice to see you all this morning. And good to see such a great number of you. Can I ask you what uh, that is? Shall we show it to the choir? See how intelligent they are? Agreed? Magnifying glass. And... uh, Can you tell me what you think? Already you know, you've had a glimpse. What is that? A telescope. A telescope, agreed? A telescope. And uh, what is that? What do you think it is? Binoculars. Binoculars, yes. And lastly, what is that? Uh, something for science. Something for science? A microscope, correct? Now, what are all those things used for? What are all those things used for? Yeah. What are they used for? Working at things. Working at things, but what else? That's right, but... Looking at stuff, but seeing things close up, up, that's exactly right. Now, can I tell you boys that someday, someday, most likely, you boys will go down to a jeweler's shop with your fiancé, and you will ask the jeweler, would you please show me some rings because I'm going to marry this young woman here and I want to get a ring. And the jeweler will bring the rings out and she'll probably say, can I have a closer look at that one? See? Closer look. That's what you use these things for, right? And when that, no matter what you do, no matter what sort of thing you're going to work at, say you're going to buy a new computer like this one here, a new laptop, You'll go down to the shop and you'll, can I have a closer look at that particular model? It's not what we say all the time. Can I have a closer look at things? And I want you today to have a closer look at the Lord Jesus. Would somebody mind handing me my Bible there? That's right. Uh, a, closer look, a closer look at Jesus because, thank you so much. Oh, wonderful. That's okay. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Because uh, the Bible is a book that's full of Jesus, the whole Bible. And I want to read to you just a short wee passage from Mark chapter 1. This is a passage 
which I discovered many years ago and which I love to talk about because I want you to take a closer look at Jesus. Because quite a lot of people think that Jesus was only a man who went around uh, doing good things, which he did. He went around talking, which he did. He had a lot of followers, which he had. But to take a closer look at Jesus, we to hear this. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Now, what I want to tell you is this, to take a closer look at that story. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? He healed them, right? That's right. And also what did he do? What did he do? He, that's great, he touched him. And you see, when you're reading the Bible, there's no word in the Bible that shouldn't be there. Every word, the word of God is a wonderful, wonderful book. And every word means something. He touched him. Now, you might miss that when you're reading through it, you see. You might go on to say, oh, he healed him, which is right, but he touched him. Now, I can I explain to you about leprosy? Leprosy was an awful disease. If anybody had leprosy, people ran away from them. They weren't allowed to live with their own family. They weren't allowed to go to school. They weren't allowed to go into any shops. They weren't allowed even to go into the local church, then called the synagogue. They weren't allowed to go anywhere like that. And they were completely alone. The only friendship they could have was with other lepers, you see? And so lepers all lived together. But they could never be close to... They had, you had to be so many yards away from anybody else who didn't have leprosy, you see. So you couldn't be with your parents or your children and so on. It was a very terrible disease. And Jesus touched him. So what I want you to do today is to make sure you take a closer look at that and say, Jesus touched him. Because nobody else would have touched him. Nobody else could have healed him. That's quite right. Jesus was healed, but nobody else would have touched him. And that's why I say, you need to take a closer look at it, you see. You see, that story. Take a closer look because it says he healed him, quite right. It says also he touched him. And that's wonderful, isn't it? That he did that. And the other thing, of course, which we all know about is that Jesus went to the cross and died for people, didn't he? He died for the sins of the world. But you know something? He died for me. And he died for you. And that means that you and I matter to God. You matter to God. Now you may not think, you might be, you mightn't be a great footballer, you might never be a great rugby player, you might never be a tennis player, you might never be many things, but you're this one thing. God loves you. And God loves even me. And God loves all of us. No matter what your past is, God loves you. And Jesus died for you. It's not superb. So you need to get a closer look at Jesus. Not just that he died for the world, but he died for me. You see? And that's what these things, that's what all these things do. These magnifying glass and microscopes and so on. Will people have a closer look at Jesus? So take a closer look at Jesus. Because he did all those things for me and did all those things for you. As if you were the only person who ever lived. Okay? We'll pray together. Lord, we thank you for the boys and girls of Glendermot. Watch over them at home and at school and in their times of recreation. In every challenge that they face. 
Help them, we pray. May they know you're present every moment of every day. And may they do well at school. And may they trust you all of their days. We commit them into your love. Surround them with grace, we pray. And as we have taken a closer look at Jesus, may they remember no one else would have touched that leprous man but Jesus. That's what he did. He's so wonderful. So bless these children, we pray in his name. Amen. We're going to sing your hymn together, uh, boys and girls, which is Jesus bids us shine with a pure, clear light, like a little candle burning it. I forgot to do the birthday box. Who has had, who has had a birthday? Is this just for the boys and girls? Uh, so this birthday box contains, what's it? Oh, it contains a gift for you. So you can help yourself there. <laughs> Go for it. A, a new pencil. And I understand that you're also given something to eat. Is that right? So grab one of those quickly now. Jesus bids us shine is the hymn. And uh, let's go for it. Go ahead. in the offering, your offering will be received. pray together. Father, receive this offering which we bring to you today. Preside over its distribution and as the congregation seeks to clear off the debt with regard to the work at the new church building, we pray, Lord, that the work will be done well, that all the workmen will be kept safe, 
that the project will proceed well and soon be completed, and also, Lord, that it will soon be free of debt. Move in the lives of all the people with a generous spirit, Lord, so that we will see the debt cleared off soon to your glory. Bless the church treasurer and the committee of the congregation as they seek to deal with this matter and grant, Lord, that it will go ahead not distracting from the mission of the church and that the building project will be completed free of debt as soon as possible. Lord, receive this offering which we bring to you now and use it for your glory, for Jesus' sake. Amen. together from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. There's a little phrase in verse 3, which you'll note as a way through. It's the little phrase, consider him. And that's what I want to think about this morning, considering Jesus. I realize that I'm lifting it from its context, but we'll talk about that in a few moments. Consider him. But this is Hebrews chapter 12. And it goes on from the wonderful chapter about all the heroes of the faith. It's sometimes called the Hall of Fame. It talks about, uh, about Abel and Noah and Abraham and Moses and so on, right down through the patriarchs. And then it comes to say this to us uh, in chapter 12. And these, the crowd of witnesses referred to are all the people of faith who have gone before and who have, com- who have been commended by God because of their faith. And he's urging us to keep going. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw, ev- let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood? And have you forgotten the words of encouragement that addresses you as sons? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, for everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. 
No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Ending there, and God, we know, will bless his word to us. Let's bow together for prayer. Lord, we remember our nation as we go through the Brexit process and pray for the prosperity of our people at this critical time. We remember the Australian people with their floods, and fires, and the loss of life, destruction of the environment, and the heartbreak that have come to the people of Australia. And we ask that you will minister into that situation. And as over these days we think about the Holocaust and the liberation of the death camps 75 years ago, And wonder how it is that the German people caught up with Nazism, with their great Christian tradition, could ever have been engulfed in such brutality and evil. We realize that people are sinners and were easily led astray. And we can worship other gods as they did during those awful years of the Third Reich. Remember those who have survived the camps, not many left now, scarred for the whole of their lives. And we pray that these things, although they have happened since, that they will never happen again. We pray for peace among the nations and for a sense of helping one another and of sharing the world's resources. There is enough food For everyone's need we know in the world, but not enough for everyone's greed. And we pray, Lord, that you'll make us to be a people compassionately concerned about one another. Bless our Queen at this time and the members of her family. It has been a difficult time for them and we pray your help for our Queen. And Lord, remember the work at Glendermott, we pray. Bless the work of the minister. Be with him on his holiday these days, we pray. We thank you for him, for his coming among the people here. And we ask that his ministry will be greatly blessed. Watch over all the people. Bless the shut-ins. Remember those who are in hospital. Remember all who mourn. Remember those who may be in prison. Remember those who may be suicidal. Remember those concerned about their marriages, about their children. Remember those who have lost their jobs. Remember the elderly people. We commit them all to you, Lord. Every member of this congregation, surround them with your love and grace. And may the congregation see Jesus and make Jesus known in these days. And we pray in his name. Amen. We're now going to sing the hymn, Would You Be Free? from your burden of sin. In the precious thought. 
say, let me get a closer look at that. I remember years ago we took our caravan to France and spent a couple of days on the way home in Paris. I wanted to see the Eiffel Tower for the first time. I wanted to see the bridges over the Seine with Napoleon's N N written upon them. I wanted to go to the place where they set up the guillotine during the uh, in 1798, the Revolution. And of course, I wanted to go to the Louvre Gallery and see da Vinci's masterpiece, the Mona Lisa. And I see some smiles around here today, just like the Mona Lisa, ladies smiling. No? Yes? Yeah? Some? Okay. Uh, and uh, people queue up to see the Mona Lisa to get a closer look, and they go around again to have a second look. And then, some months ago, my wife and I and our daughter and granddaughter spent a few days in London. She wanted, my granddaughter wanted to see the crown jewels. And we went down to the Tower of London and went into the jewel house, joined the queue to see the crown jewels. And uh, rather than having people standing around, there is a moving walkway in front of the crown jewels now, which you stand upon and it moves you along very slowly. So the crowd's always moving, and this huge, long glass case, well illuminated, and you see the jewels there in breathtaking array. The orb and the scepter, the crowns, the ampulla, the anointing spoon, and all shining gold with diamonds and rubies and other invaluable gems. And people are having a really good close look and their eyes are popping out at the, the, the fantastic beauty of it all. And the walkway goes along very slowly. If you want to get another closer look, you can walk up around the back and you can stand at the back and look the other side of them all and then you can, maybe if somebody lets you on, you can join the moving walkway again so that you get a good look at the crown jewels. Well, last December I was ordained for 50 years. And during those 50 years, it has been my inexpressible delight and my awesome responsibility to let people get a closer look at Christ. In all sorts of settings, public and private, it's been my joy to have men and women and young people Consider him. And uh, we read from Hebrews chapter 12, but that little text, Consider him, appears. I know it's there to get people who were under persecution 
to think about Jesus and to follow him, consider him. But this morning, I want you to have a closer look at Jesus. Let me get a closer look at Christ. And there are three headings, there always seem to be three headings, three wee headings about his amazing person and work. First of all, he is the creative Christ. Get a closer look at that. He is the compassionate Christ and he is the crucified Christ. A lot of people have a very general view about Jesus. It used to be saying people regard Jesus as the pale Galilean preacher, the man who gathered some friends around him, but they don't really take a closer look at him. It's good to take a closer look. Now, we live in a world of great uncertainty. Hedonism abounds, that's seeking for pleasure, and yet people aren't really very happy generally. The drug culture has failed to give young and old meaning and hope. A lot of people live empty lives. Mental issues are much to the fore, particularly here in Northern Ireland. Nationally and internationally, there is grave danger. Homelessness and poverty are increasing. There are many broken-hearted people running around. Parents concerned about their wayward children. Our world is sick and blind. And there's a lot of fear And of course now the world is deliberately marginalising the church. And the well-tried and true biblical ways are being laughed at today. Our world has been hollowed out by sin. So let's consider Christ. Somebody here may say, why should I bother? Well, he and his teaching has inspired men and women throughout the generations. They have done great things because of Christ. They have allowed themselves to be killed because of Christ. He's inspired wonderful artists and architects and preachers and politicians and musicians, philanthropists, missionaries, philosophers, and an innumerable host of ordinary citizens have lived to please him. And that's some of the reasons why you need to think about him. The Christ the church proclaims is, first of all, the creative Christ. Now get that one right. The creative Christ. Colossians chapter 1 is full of this. It tells us that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Meaning this, if you want to know what God is like, then you need to look at Jesus Christ. Now, when I was a young fella, I thought Jesus Christ was his name, you know, like Jimmy Jones or Sidney Smith. In other words, his first name was Jesus, his second name was Christ. That, of course, is totally wrong. It is Jesus the Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the long-awaited hope of the world and saviour of the world is Jesus. So, wondering what God is like, focus on Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that he is the creator of all things. The pale Galilean preacher that we think about he, he is the great personal truth behind the universe. Take a closer look at Jesus. He is the cosmic Lord. He, all powers, authorities and rulers were created by him. And wonderfully for him. In fact, Paul says he is before all things. In eternity past, he was God and all things hold together because of him. All the laws of nature. If I drop my watch this morning, I know it's going to fall to the ground because of the law of gravity. That was designed by Christ. 
If I drop my watch tomorrow, the law of gravity will say it will fall again tomorrow. Why? Because of Christ. The universe is there because of him. Take a closer look at Jesus. He, he is the firstborn from the dead. The people Jesus raised from the dead died again. Jesus was raised from the dead never to die again. In fact, he is preeminent over everything. God was pleased to make all his fullness dwell in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about Jesus like that? Take a closer look at him. Maybe you think about him as a helpless baby at Mary's breast. That all happened. The the incarnation is a wonderful truth. But he is more than that. He is the living, reigning, creative Christ. So worship him. He's worthy of your worship. Angels worship him now. And the faithful who have fallen asleep in Jesus worship him now. Is he not someone you can worship? Praise and serve. He is the creative Christ. Secondly, he's the compassionate Christ. And the New Testament abounds with many references to highlight this truth about him. I love two of them in particular. We talked to the boys and girls. uh, uh, The first one was from Mark chapter 1. We talked to the kids about that. The other one is Mark chapter 5. One's about a leper. Now let me stress to you again, a leper was a poor soul, outcast from society and his family because of his serious and wasting malady. He had to ring a bell when he went down the road if he met any other human being, lest that person would breathe in some of the air which the leper had breathed out, because that's the way the thought Leprosy was transmitted in those days. Also, he had to call out, unclean, unclean, and stay a hundred yards away from any other human being who did not have leprosy. It was an awful thing to be a leper. And he said to Jesus, Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. And the compassionate Jesus And after all the years, this always thrills me. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched him. Remember that. And then he said, I will be clean. And he was. The compassionate Christ. No one else would have touched him. That's the point. And then... Mark chapter 5, we have a man called Jairus who has a 12-year-old daughter who's ill. In fact, she's so ill that Jairus believes she's soon going to die. He was a leader of the local synagogue community. Please come to my house, says Jairus, and lay your hands on my daughter and heal her because she's at the point of death. It was an earnest petition of a caring, loving father about his 12-year-old lovely daughter. And wonderfully, Mark records these words, and these words have thrilled me since the first time I read them many years ago, and they thrill me as much today. And they're simple words. Jesus went with him. He didn't say, I'm too busy. Come again later on in the afternoon. Look for me next week. Why should I bother with you, Jairus? Jesus went with him. Do you see his compassion? Does it not thrill you? No excuses, not too busy. Not only does he go to Jairus' house, but on the way to Jairus' house, they get the news that the 12-year-old daughter has died. And they say, don't bother the teacher anymore, Jairus. Your daughter's dead. And when they reach the house, all the professional mourners have moved in. And there's tears. And Jesus 
puts them all out, takes in some of his disciples with the parents and raises the girl to life again. And then wonderfully, wonderfully, and Mark, remember when Mark wrote this, Mark, we believe, got his information from the Apostle Peter, who was there. Now, why do you think Peter adds this little phrase? Little phrase is, he raised her to life, and then he said to the parents, give her something to eat. Because the Lord Jesus Christ knew, as we all know, that children, we saw it here this morning, children love to eat. We all love to eat, but they love to eat. Give her something to eat. It's not fantastic that the compassionate, creative Christ could say, give her something to eat. Take a closer look at Jesus. And one more reference about the compassion of Christ. Paul, Paul says, memory in Romans chapter 5, memorably and wonderfully he says this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What about that? He died for you and me when we were in the state of rebellion against him. While we served Satan and were dead in sin, wonders of wonders, the compassion of Christ died to save me, giving his blood as the ransom for my lost, hell-deserving soul. You remember the famous artist who was driving through the gorbels in Glasgow one time and he saw this Glasgow urchin with jam down his vest and his clothes not very clean. And he said to the wee boy, where do you live? And he told him. He went round to the the house and he, he said, can I come tomorrow and paint your son? Oh, the mother said, of course you can. He went back the next day. He didn't recognize the wee boy. He had his face washed and his hair combed and his clothes cleaned and he looked different. And the artist said, I'm terribly sorry. I don't want to paint him now. I wanted to paint him just as he was. And Jesus comes to us just as we are. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thirdly then, he's the crucified Christ. Salvation is the great theme of the whole Bible. You remember John Barry's great hymn, In the cross of Christ I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round his head sublime. Towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the empires that have come and gone. The Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, the British Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Third Reich, the French Empire. All of them have gone or will go in the towering o'er the wrecks of time. And then all the light of sacred story, all the light of the Bible the cross gathers round its head sublime. We go to a lonely hill shaped like a skull outside Jerusalem. There are three crosses there. The middle one is occupied by the perfect, sinless Jesus, the Son of God. Why? Why is he there? What evil had he done? He never abused anybody. Never exploited anybody. Never killed anybody. He was love personified. He healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. He made the crooked straight. He cared for the children. He was never refuted in any debate. He raised the dead. He walked in water. He was God on earth. And the forces of evil could not simply bear him. Herod found no fault at him, nor could Pilate. Hired witnesses were, fa- were used to concoct stories about him, all lies. The centurion in charge of the crucifixion said, surely this man is innocent. You see, the point is, Jesus came into the world to die. Now, of course, we all die. I will die 
because of sin. Sin, death is all part of the sinful world in which we live. I will die because of sin, but Jesus, who had no sin of his own, did not die because of sin. He died for sin. My sin nailed him to the cross. There's no gospel without a cross. In the overarching plan of God, Christ died for me. The prophets and the psalmist told about it. The psalmist tells her all his bones will be dislocated. The prophets talked about him being mocked and beaten. They foretold where he'll be born. They foretold his resurrection and his kingship. He is the crucified Christ. And that's why Peter in 1 Peter 3 says, For Christ died for our sins, yours and mine that is, once for all, to bring you and me to God. Take a closer look at Jesus. I remember years ago reading about, and it impressed me to this moment, a man called A.B. Simpson wrote, You may talk about Alexander the Great and Napoleon the Great, but do not talk about Jesus the Great. He is not the Great. He is the only. He's in a class all of his own. Friends, take a closer look at Christ. Do you remember the dying thief who trusted Jesus? He was being crucified for his crimes as he hung there that day and witnessed the events of the cross. He saw beyond his immediate circumstances when he said to Jesus, Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? So the dying thief was a man who saw that Jesus was the king of a kingdom and a kingdom yet to be. Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He realized that the cross was not the end for Jesus. And Jesus said to him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. It is imperative, my friends, that we all consider the crucified Christ because he was crucified for you and me, dying in our place. Will you take a closer look at Jesus? He's the creative Christ, the compassionate Christ, the crucified Christ. But can I ask you, is he your Lord and your Savior? That's your response. What will your response be? Remember, take a closer look at Jesus, creative Christ, compassionate Christ, crucified Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. From the book of Genesis to the book of the Revelation, he is the great figure in the Bible, and we thank you for him. Remind us of these truths, Lord, and help us to glory in his cross and to live for his glory day by day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's conclude as we sing a very appropriate hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
of all grace, who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, restore you, make you strong, firm and steadfast, and to him be the power and glory forever and ever. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen.